1942. The Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union had brought war on a catastrophic scale deep inside the Russian interior. One final stronghold remained in Hitler's way. At Stalingrad, German forces were locked in a deadly struggle with the city's beleaguered Red Army defenders. In the terrible battle, half a million Nazi troops were killed, wounded, or captured, and more than three quarters of a million Russians. But far from being the last step in the Nazi conquest, the fight for the ruined city proved a bloody failure for the Germans. Why did Hitler's forces lose the battle for Stalingrad? In late 1942, the Second World War was in its third year. Nazi forces had reached more than 500 miles into the Soviet Union. Their objective, the vast natural reserves of the Russian interior. For Hitler, the attack on the Soviet Union had several purposes. He wanted to destroy Jewish Bolshevism, which he saw as his major world enemy. But on the other hand, he also wanted the vast resources of the Soviet Union, because he knew he could then build a huge German economic empire. The majority of these resources lay in the east of the Soviet Union. Most valuable of all were the huge oil fields of the Caucasus. To capture these, Hitler unleashed the panzer divisions of his 6th Army. The Nazi Blitzkrieg tore across the Russian steppe. The last obstacle that lay in Germany's way was the city of Stalingrad. Well, Stalingrad becomes uh, an important object of the German army kind of by accident, because the real objective of the offensive was the Caucasus and the oil. There's nothing particularly valuable in Stalingrad. It, it does control the, the river line from the Volga. Once you'd captured Stalingrad, you could cut the Volga. Once you cut the Volga, you stopped the oil flowing from the Caucasus. From the German point of view, Stalingrad made increasing strategic sense. Hitler and his commanders were confident that the city would be in German hands in just a few days. But Stalingrad did not fall. Somehow, the Russians held out against the mighty German army. For 200 days, the savage battle raged on until the Red Army forced the surrender of Nazi forces in the city. How did this extraordinary turnaround come about? The Germans were well-trained and highly equipped with a string of victories behind them. By comparison, the Red Army was inexperienced and old-fashioned. Legend has it that the Germans were unprepared for the savage Russian winter. But the latest research is now showing that familiarity with freezing weather was not the only ace up the Red Army's sleeve. August 23, 1942. For the initial assault on Stalingrad, the Germans unleashed the full power of Blitzkrieg. One of the first things the Germans decided to do in Stalingrad, of course, was to mount a huge bombing attack on the city. I think they assumed that this would accelerate defeat, it would demoralize the defenders, it would create panic among the population. Mass bombing raids decimated the city. More than 40,000 civilians were killed. German artillery fire also rained down. In just a few days, Stalingrad was transformed into a shattered maze of ruins. Yet despite this, the population didn't panic. The Red Army wasn't demoralized. Why didn't overwhelming German firepower prevail? More than 60 years later, the city has been completely rebuilt. It's now known as Volgograd. David Hatton is a blast consultant. 
a specialist in how structures are affected by explosive force. He's come to Volgograd to investigate the way the city's buildings were affected by the Nazi bombing. He suspects this may be the first step in understanding why the Nazis were unable to take Stalingrad. A few of the buildings still bear traces of the fighting. Here in this passageway between two of the, these early surviving buildings, we can see some of the damage. On the wall above us, there's a whole range of bullet holes. And further over to the corner, we can see an area where the brickwork looks rough. That's where a hole was punched through the, the wall. The brick fragments were collected, and the whole thing was recreated to um, reinstate the building to its former condition. In the decades since the battle, much of the original damage has been repaired in this way. So for more evidence of the city's appearance during the fighting, Haddon visits a unique museum. It's entirely dedicated to the battle for Stalingrad. It holds a collection of original documents and photographs of the city during the war. Researchers at the museum used information like this to produce a survey of the city's battle damage. The result was this amazing model. More than 20 feet long, it's an exact record of what downtown Stalingrad looked like at the end of the battle. This is an amazingly detailed model built up from thousands of records and photographs taken at the time, which shows the whole city and really shows what a terrifying place it must have been at the height of the battle. Despite being pounded with more than 100,000 tons of bombs, Stalingrad was not completely razed to the ground. The model shows that a surprising number of the city's buildings remained standing. But Haddon has noticed something about the pattern of the devastation. I think some of the things that come out of it are just how well preserved the street plan still still is even after all the destruction that's taken place. Um, where damage has occurred to buildings, the debris seems to have generally fallen within the footprint of the building itself rather than being spread outside. Maybe this is a clue as to how the German attack failed. To investigate further, Haddon needs to get a closer look at a surviving Stalingrad building. He is given special access to the city's flour mill. It's the only remaining structure to have been preserved exactly as it was at the end of the war. Overlooking the Volga, the mill was one of the city's most distinctive landmarks. It was the scene of fierce fighting. This is a tremendous, uh, really sturdy looking structure. It's um, obviously brickwork on the outside. It's about five stories high, very thick, sturdy walls. But I'm really interested to see the structure inside, just to see how that might help to tie the whole building together. But on the inside, Haddon finds that the flour mill's brick exterior is deceptive. Wow. Look at this uh, fantastic structure. It uh, really looks like a, a classic example of early reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete was the material of choice for Stalin's mass building programs of the 1930s. It was a relatively new technique at the time. Exploring the building, Haddon finds hundreds of holes made by artillery and mortar rounds. The concrete steel reinforcing bars seem to have limited these smaller hits. But at the top of the building, there is evidence of at least one massive aerial bomb impact. How did the flour mill survive this? Haddon believes this has to do with the way the building reacted to an explosive blast. The explosion of a bomb creates a wave of energy. Blast is most destructive when contained. For example, when a bomb explodes inside an undamaged building. Haddon has generated a computer model to show what happens in such an explosion. You see here the initial explosion taking place and the, the shock wave rushing out and then hitting the walls and the roof and, and the, the floor of this little chamber 
and because it's trapped there's nowhere for the explosive to go so it, it keeps coming back it keeps hitting the walls time and time again and that makes the damage potentially much worse than it would be if it was out in the open this is what happened in the initial wave of German bombings when many of Stalingrad's buildings were hit for the first time these impacts caused obvious damage destroying roofs and burning out combustible wooden floorboards and fittings but Haddon believes destruction like this left Stalingrad's buildings less vulnerable to subsequent bombings. Where you have penetration, breaching of the, the roof and the walls of the structure, that can actually make things better by dissipating the effects of an internal explosion. This model is a, an example of what happens when an explosion takes place within a building that has got holes in it. The windows have been blown out or the roof's been, been blown away. The blast energy escapes out the side and it potentially does much less damage to the remaining parts of the structure. And this mirrors very well what I saw in the flour mill. Damaged buildings, often little more than burnt out shells, could take many more hits before collapsing. Without roofs, windows or even floors, there were many holes through which blast could escape. Haddon's investigation shows that the bombing of Stalingrad, though terrible at first, actually had only limited effect. The city was not flattened, but transformed into a maze of partly ruined buildings which simply absorbed further impacts. And there was another consequence. Haddon has found that buildings often collapsed within their own footprints, surrounded by wide boulevards. For Red Army fighters, this created the perfect environment for defense. Buildings were adapted into individual strong points, fortresses of rubble and iron. Nazi forces found themselves engaged with a bitterly determined foe in a nightmarish environment created by their own bombing. It forced them reluctantly into a new kind of depraved warfare. The German Blitzkrieg attack on Stalingrad was not effective enough. Mass bombing and shelling ruined, but not completely destroyed the city. So the German commander launched the 6th Army on a ground assault. General Friedrich Paulus assured Hitler that Stalingrad would fall before the end of September 1942. But months later, German troops still had not taken the city. Instead, they were enmeshed in a savage struggle for the maze of ruins, and victory seemed further away than ever. For the German forces, Stalingrad was a puzzle. They did everything right. They, they reached the edge of Stalingrad, uh, destroyed everything in their path, uh, tanks, aircraft, they did the normal things. Um, and then they got bogged down in, in Stalingrad. After air power failed, the Germans turned to the mainstay of their ground forces, armor. In the initial invasion of Russia in summer 1941, Operation Barbarossa, German panzer divisions swept all Red Army resistance before them. But now in Stalingrad, it was a very different matter. Why were the Germans not more successful using tank attacks? David Fletcher is an expert on German armor of World War II. Now this is the Panzer IV. This is the tank which would have dominated the Panzer divisions on the Eastern Front at the time of Stalingrad. On the open plains of the Russian steppe, tanks like this were ideal for fast-moving blitzkrieg warfare. But David Fletcher thinks these tanks would have been less effective in Stalingrad. Where these tanks come unstuck is fighting in a urban environment and the more ruined that urban environment the worse it is rubble and wreckage made it hard for the tanks to maneuver this made them easy targets worse still for the Germans panzer crews were at a serious disadvantage when attacked by Russian troops firing from the upper stories of buildings the main armament is designed for horizontal firing it doesn't have substantial elevation to deal with targets above the line of sight. Problems like this meant that German commanders could no longer rely on armor to bear the brunt of their attacks. 
As the battle dragged on, what tanks the Germans did use fell victim to an entirely unexpected enemy. As conditions in Stalingrad worsened, the city became overrun with rats. German tanks became infested, and electrical wiring covered with fabric insulation was particularly vulnerable to hungry rodents. You've got a short circuit, for example, in the electrics feeding the turret, and you've lost the immediate power for rapid turret traverse, you've lost whatever lighting you've got, and in many tanks you've actually lost the mechanism for firing the gun. And the effect of that is sufficient to render it completely incapable of fighting. Whether they were put out of action in this way or were simply unsuited to the rubble-strewn environment, German tanks played little part in the battle for Stalingrad. Instead, the task fell to the highly trained grenadiers of the German infantry. By October 1942, after the first month of fighting, there were more than 100,000 German infantrymen engaged in the battle. But still, the breakthrough did not come. In the war in the rubble, the Germans lose any technical advantage that they had, and it becomes down to small groups of men fighting uh, one another. This is the first time they've had to fight this kind of urban warfare against a determined enemy. And it involves making up on the spot new tactics, new ways of dealing with how you cope with an entrenched enemy. The German infantry hated this dirty close quarter combat so much, they called it Rattenkrieg, or rat war. The harsh conditions in Stalingrad were the same for both sides. Yet as the fighting dragged on, the Germans found their Russian opponents showed no signs of weakening. How was it that poorly trained Russian troops were able to hold out against Hitler's Wehrmacht? Russian commanders knew they could not stand up to German attacks in the open. Instead, they had to find a way to even the odds. Damaged buildings were fortified and connected by a maze of trenches through the rubble. Red Army troops sheltered from German firepower in basements converted into bunkers. Oleg Bukowski was a scout for raiding parties. His homegrown knowledge of the city made him an ideal guide. We used everything, even the sewer system beneath the city streets, any place where it was possible to get through. We often marched through the sewage water in the tunnels, and it was so stinky and disgusting. The Russian commander, General Vasily Chuikov, coined a phrase for his soldiers' ingenuity in adapting to these tactics. He called it the Stalingrad Academy of Street Fighting. In this war of attrition, troops on both sides found that the bombed-out city was ideally suited to the infantryman's most dreaded opponent, the sniper. The cities like Stalingrad, which had been pounded to rubble and ruin, were an absolute playground for snipers. Buildings half standing, half fallen down. There's almost an unlimited number of places a sniper could hide. Martin Pegler of Britain's Royal Armouries has studied the German and Russian sniping tactics used in Stalingrad. The research has led him to suspect that the Soviets had the edge on their Nazi opponents. There was little to choose between the rifles that were used. The most vital piece of equipment was the telescopic sight, or scope. The Russians put a lot of thought into the manufacture of their scopes, and they decided that these big old-fashioned turn-of-the-century hunting-type scopes were not really the way to be heading with optical technology. They came up with a much more compact, much more modern design. But it wasn't as simple as just fixing the scope onto a weapon. Before going into action, the sniper had to be sure that the scope was properly prepared. The process is known as zeroing. The whole point of zeroing a rifle is that when you put a scope onto it, you have to make sure that the point of impact of the bullet is exactly the same as where the crosshairs on the scope are. The only way to do that is to fire a few rounds through the rifle, and with each shot, you adjust your scope until the two meet perfectly. 
Pegler believes that through this zeroing process, he may be able to show how the Soviets had an advantage. Using original World War II rifles and scopes, exactly like those used at Stalingrad, he sets up a test to see which is easier to zero. He first uses the German system with the Mauser K98 rifle. We undo the locking screw. The scope is well engineered, but requires a tool to adjust between shots. and that rifle is now zeroed. Pegler tests the scope on a Soviet Mazen Nagant rifle and notices a big difference right away. Seven ring, six o'clock. The adjustment on these Soviet scopes is an awful lot simpler than on the Mauser. There's no tools involved. I can just do it with my fingers. It makes life a lot easier for the sniper. Nine ring, four o'clock. Center, X. It takes only three shots before the Soviet rifle is zeroed. As the was in zeroed, it was very easy. Just use the adjuster drums, it took me three shots and it's spot on. If for any reason I lose the zero, if I need to return the zero again, it's a very straightforward process. If my life was going to depend on sniping, I think I would probably opt for the Mozin. The Soviet scope gave Red Army marksmen an advantage. But it doesn't alone explain why Russian snipers were so dominant in Stalingrad. The Russian sniper had a very profound effect at Stalingrad. The Germans loathed and feared the Soviet snipers. They couldn't get away from it. It didn't matter where they were. A careless movement, just showing your head a little bit too much above a trench, would bring a sniper's bullet. Many Russian snipers, like the celebrated Vasily Zaitsev, were recruited from remote areas such as Siberia, where marksmanship was vital for hunting. But it seems it was more than just hunters that were involved with shooting in the pre-war years in Russia. In the 1930s, millions and millions of, uh, of young Russians, men and women, had uh, gone out to get their sharpshooter badge, which meant you qualified, really, as, as an effective sniper. And when the war came, the Soviet Union had a culture, really, among its young people, um, of shooting with great accuracy. It was a culture that would prove immensely valuable to the Red Army. This cult of, of sniperism grew up mainly through the media. They made their snipers into heroes. Um, they were people who were lauded publicly, given honors and awards, whereas in every other country, the sniper was regarded as rather the dirty dog of war. With large numbers of experienced sharpshooters using high quality, simple to use scopes, the Red Army inflicted heavy physical and psychological casualties on the Germans. By late November 1942, the German assault on Stalingrad had reached a bloody stalemate. The situation was about to become even worse as both sides prepared for the onset of a mutual foe, the Russian winter. The German blitzkrieg attacks on Stalingrad had failed. Now they were engaged in bitter guerrilla warfare with Red Army fighters. In November 1942, the situation worsened with the first snows of winter. Temperatures plummeted to as low as minus 40 degrees. For the Germans, who had expected to take Stalingrad by September, of course, um, the onset of winter was always going to be a problem. The savage winter, known to the Red Army as General Frost, 
is seen by many historians to have been a major factor in the German failure at Stalingrad. The cold affected both sides equally, and so can't in itself be a reason why the Germans were defeated. But military equipment was vulnerable to the sub-zero temperatures. Mechanical systems were liable to freeze if they were not properly maintained, including radios, vehicle engines, and weapons. It was often so cold that even gun oil froze, rendering weapons useless. Sniping expert Martin Pegler has heard that the Russians had a simple method that helped them keep their weapons working through the winter. He's found that to keep oil fluid, the Russians added gasoline. Pegler sets up an experiment to test the Russian method. He's using two original Russian Mazen Nagant rifles from World War II. One using the Russian oil and gasoline mix, the other using plain oil as used by the Germans. A climate chamber is used to simulate the Russian temperatures. After being stored for just two hours, the equivalent to a soldier's period of sentry duty, Pegler finds a noticeable difference between the two mixes of oil. Whilst the German oil has solidified to the point where it's like wax, completely immovable, the Soviet oil is still liquid. But the real test will be how the rifles have been affected. First, he tries the one with the Russian gasoline and oil mix. Well, it works. This is the German rifle. See how this one functions. Well, it does work, but it's very stiff. It is functioning, but it's an awful lot stiffer than the Russian rifle. So I think we can take it that the oil hasn't worked as effectively as the Russian rifle has done. Pegler's research backs up German accounts which tell of soldiers having to throw away weapons after they jammed because of the cold. As the Russians held out into the depths of winter, both sides were engaged in virtual Arctic warfare. It seems there were other differences in the ways in which both sides prepared their troops for the cold. Tony Barton is a specialist on historical clothing. He spent years studying the uniforms worn by both the Germans and the Russians in World War II. The German uniform is really a culmination of the 19th century uniform tradition. He's wearing a shirt, possibly with a vest underneath it. He's got a woolen tunic. He's got a woolen greatcoat on top of that. One of the problems they had was in the winter, wearing a helmet is not a very good idea because the steel shell cools off incredibly quickly, which means your head's extremely cold. And there were problems with this with soldiers developing frostbite in the severe conditions. Barton has found that the Russians had a very different approach. Well, this soldier is wearing fairly heavy underwear, normally cotton in, in the winter. He's got a woolen tunic on, on top of that. And both of these are loose fitting. Over the tunic, he's wearing a padded telegraica, which is a typical Central Asian garment made of quilted layers of padded cotton. It's the sort of thing worn by a nomad horseman on the steppe. They're extremely intelligent use of uh, materials because they're very cheap, they're relatively easy to make, and they give fantastically good insulating properties. Instead of steel helmets, many Russian soldiers were issued with a fur cap called a nushanka. Everybody says it's a real fur hat. It isn't a real fur hat, it's actually a fake fur hat. The average Russian soldier referred to it as fish fur since it came from no animal that they'd actually ever seen, so it must have come from a fish. Six decades after the Battle of Stalingrad, can Tony Barton uncover the secret of why the Russians did so much better in the cold? It's another task for the climate chamber. Thermocouples, devices for measuring temperature, will enable Barton to compare how the garments resist the cold. <laughs> 
The mannequins begin the test at normal room temperature, 72 degrees, or 21 to 23 degrees Celsius. Inside the chamber, it's minus 40. Almost immediately, the two uniforms begin to react differently. It is actually beginning to show a difference now. The Russian is retaining his heat a little bit better. Of course, the uniforms are made of different materials which will have different thermal capacities, so there'll be differential rates of cooling. The chamber also circulates the air to simulate wind chill. This cools the mannequins much faster than still air. Very soon, there's a difference of several degrees. After 30 minutes, the German has fallen to one degree centigrade, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, while the Russian is still at five degrees centigrade, 41 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a substantial difference. So I think our experiment here has definitely shown that the German is, the German is losing heat at a greater rate than the Russian is. Quilted jackets and artificial pile fabrics ensured that Russian soldiers were extremely well equipped for low temperatures. German soldiers, on the other hand, suffered extreme privation through their lack of proper equipment for the cold. But as 1942 drew to a close, urgent messages reached Stalingrad from the German high command. And this time, the Russian winter was the very least of their problems. In the depths of winter, November 1942 to January 1943, the German bid to capture Stalingrad ground to a halt. It had become a grim tooth and nail struggle with the Russians. As if the battle for survival against the freezing temperatures was not enough, troops on both sides now had to contend with another enemy lurking in the shattered city. In this terrible environment, uh, it was very difficult to keep both armies in a good medical state. There were injuries that, and wounds that simply couldn't be treated properly, medicines were running low, um, disease, dysentery and so on was, was, was widespread. What remained of Stalingrad was an environmental nightmare. Sewers had been ripped open by bombing. Dead bodies lay in the streets, and the water supply was contaminated. But research at Volgograd's Panorama Museum is now revealing what helped the Russians deal with the problem of disease. Svetlana Argasheva has researched the role played during World War II by a woman known as Zeneda Yermoleva. Even today, few details are known. Her work was considered so valuable by the Russians that it was a closely guarded military secret. В общем-то, надо сказать о том, что тогда во время войны это бесспорно были супер секретные разработки. Actually, I must say in wartime, these were super secret developments. This kind of information was of the highest importance. Because of her work, Yamolova herself was considered as important as three top Russian commanders put together. And it was through her research that infection was beaten in the Red Army. Records show that in 1942, Red Army commanders realized there was a major threat of disease among the defenders of Stalingrad. They needed a specialist. The brilliant young bacteriologist Yamoleva was sent to Stalingrad in July 1942. Argasheva has found that Yamoleva worked in appalling conditions in Stalingrad to produce vaccines for diseases such as typhus and tularemia. It's likely she saved the lives of thousands of Russian soldiers. Just a few hundred yards away across the rubble, the German army faced a severe medical situation. One crisis in particular mystified German army medics. 
the German high command noticed that some of the soldiers were just dropping dead, you know, without having any, any wounds or, you know, without having any, any particular reason for dying. Medical doctor Sean Burrell has researched this mystery affliction suffered by the 6th Army. He's found that the Germans also sent a medical expert to Stalingrad. Dr. Hans Gergensen was flown into the German sector in December 1942. In appalling conditions, he conducted dozens of autopsies to find out what had killed the soldiers. The bodies are frozen solid, so what he ha actually had to do was to um, thaw the bodies out before he could do the autopsies. Gergensen was shocked by what he found. The heart, the liver, the other organs basically atrophied. In other words, they'd shrunk and uh, were unable to perform the normal functions that we require them to do. Gergensen noted one detail common to all the corpses. They were almost totally devoid of body fat. He concluded with surprise that it was not disease, but starvation that had killed the men. He's talking about the fact that uh, towards the end, the soldiers were possibly on only two slices of bread a day. And sometimes, if they were lucky, half a liter of horse stew, which was very watery and only had four or five small cubes of horse meat in it. Gergensen responded immediately. The men were to be fed meat paste, high in fat content. Yet this had an entirely unexpected effect. Far from curing German soldiers, they seemed to be dying even more quickly. The army doctors were mystified. Only recently have medical researchers worked out what was happening. To actually suddenly feed people that have been starved for weeks on end um, can cause um, a phenomenon that we now call refeeding syndrome. Often when you're malnourished and you're, you're starved, then the, the levels of phosphate in your body are very low. Now, to then be fed, rather than increasing the levels of phosphate, causes an initial drop in the phosphate level that can cause an arrhythmia or an irregular rhythm of the heart that can be enough to cause cardiac failure. Without knowledge of refeeding syndrome, the German medics continued to unwittingly kill their own men. In this way, the effectiveness of the German army was seriously weakened. General Paulus's besieging force in Stalingrad was itself about to become besieged. From out of the frozen wastes around Stalingrad was about to be unleashed a surprise Soviet counterattack of staggering proportions. After nearly 10 weeks of dehumanizing street warfare, the German 6th Army was no closer to capturing Stalingrad. His troops weakened by the cold and malnutrition, the German commander Paulus knew his army was a spent force. Hitler, however, had other ideas. For Hitler, there was one key objective by the end of 1942. He had to take Stalingrad. He was determined to take Stalingrad. I think he couldn't really understand how the Soviet forces had managed to withstand this attack for such a long period of time. I think he always thought that he was on the point of winning, that you know, the Soviets just had one last gasp and then the city would be in German hands. The final turn of events in the Battle of Stalingrad would leave Hitler deeply shocked. Rososhka, 30 miles west of modern-day Volgograd. There was a village here, completely destroyed in World War II. A team of young Russians is searching for the bodies of Red Army soldiers. It's not difficult. In just a few hours digging, they've unearthed more than a dozen skeletons. Over the last few years in this area alone, hundreds have been recovered. Of more than 8 million Russian soldiers killed in World War II, many are still missing. Galina Oreshkina, a local school teacher, has dedicated herself to trying to identify some of these individuals. Army records are rare, so she works from surviving letters and photographs 
sometimes aided by the fragments of personal items found with the bodies. Rososhka is miles from the scene of the fighting in Stalingrad. How was it that there was so much loss of life here? We often think of the Stalingrad battle, of course, as simply being a, a battle for this broken city, but this is very misleading. German forces had a huge area of, of land around Stalingrad, too. And above all, the master stroke, the, the thing which finally, finally undid the Germans, was something which happened 100 miles away from, from Stalingrad. On November 19, 1942, the Red Army launched a colossal counterattack. Artillery pounded the German positions, and thousands of infantry supported by tanks and even cavalry attacked. Paulus was taken completely by surprise. In just a few days, the entire German 6th Army was surrounded and cut off. While Chuyakov held the Germans in the city, the Russian leader Stalin turned to another of his commanders to come up with a plan. When the commanders in Moscow looked at the Stalingrad battle, of course, they, they realized they had some very narrow options. By this stage, the young General Zhukov saw that really the only answer to, to Stalingrad was not to keep fighting in the city itself, which was a mess. The only answer really was to find some way of cutting the German front in the south, perhaps encircling German forces at, uh, at Stalingrad. And this was really the key operation. This was the, 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 the origins of that extraordinary operation, Operation Uran. Operation Uran, or Uranus, depended for its success on complete surprise. Uh, the Germans didn't expect a Russian counterattack. The whole idea of the attack, the Russians are able to move their troops without the Germans seeing them. It's this question of uh, disinformation, of, of camouflaging their attack, which is part of the brilliance of, of what they do. They mass a whole new army group, which the Germans don't see until the counterattack is mounted. More than one million Red Army troops were secretly assembled to take part in the operation. After a series of fast-moving, bloody battles, the two huge wings completed the encirclement at Kalach, not far from Roshoska. More than 90,000 Russian soldiers died during this operation alone. By the end of January 1943, the German 6th Army in Stalingrad was in a desperate situation. It was a far cry from the conquering force which had invaded Russia two years before. Unable to use their tanks, Paulus's troops had been ground down in the street-fighting rot war in which their Red Army opponents proved adept, turning ruins into strongholds and plaguing the Germans with sniper fire. Ill-equipped for the winter and worn down by malnutrition, the remnants were finally strangled into submission after Zhukov's brilliant envelopment. January 31st, against Hitler's orders, Paulus finally surrendered. This was the very first time in the course of the war, in three years of war, that large numbers of Germans had been taken prisoner. One of the things that really brought back to the German people the fact that, that this really was a major defeat is that the whole army had been encircled and captured, and huge numbers of Germans had now gone into captivity. The German bid to capture Stalingrad had failed. It was the first great German defeat of Hitler's war. This is something new, something that hasn't happened before. A whole German army has been destroyed in, in battle. Uh, the Germans are vulnerable, the Germans are not supermen, the German ca Germans can be defeated. And it makes a, a kind of moral turning point throughout Europe, uh, and maybe the turning point of, of, the, of the whole war, certainly in the East, possibly the whole of the Second World War. With Stalingrad saved, the Russians could begin the long fight back against Hitler's invaders. Although Stalingrad is a very important battle, we have to be aware this is simply the first time that the German offensive has been stopped. A great deal still needs to be done. It's not a straightforward decline after this. The Soviets have got to learn to fight better than the Germans, and that's what they do in the course of 1943. 
more than two million soldiers and civilians lost their lives in the battle for Stalingrad. Of the 91,000 Germans taken prisoner by the Red Army, fewer than 6,000 ever returned home. In the fog of war, details are lost in chaos. D-Day was no exception until now. With unprecedented CG recreations and eye-in-the-sky photos, witness the Battle of Normandy like never before. The lost evidence of D-Day. Tonight at 8 on the History Channel.